Good morning, everybody. I hope you are keeping well. I hope you are keeping sane. Um, what I'm going to do is monologue for, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes. And at the end of that, take any questions, assuming that uh, you're all still awake. Um, and the way I want to start, kind of by summary at the start, is to say that where we find ourselves in the current circumstances, where we find ourselves is believing that it is perfectly rational, perfectly rational to do nothing, or at least to do very little if we're not sure. You know, as the motto or piece of advice runs, when in doubt, do nothing. Yeah. And keeping that advice or motto at the forefront of our minds, uh, what I'd like to do, first of all, is to review with you the positioning uh, and the strategy uh, for Finsbury Growth and Income Trust. And I've got two general observations. The first is to reiterate that Finsbury Growth and Income Trust portfolio is very predominantly oriented towards big cap companies. Over 90% by value of the portfolio is invested in FTSE 100 companies or their equivalent. And by that, I mean, we have uh, two or three non-UK companies, but they are very substantive businesses themselves. Now, having said that, I, I do want to submit that some of the so-called big companies that we have within Finsbury's portfolio, some of the so-called big companies, we would still argue are actually, are actually still small companies relative to their potential and relative to their warranted value. So for instance, uh, a FTSE 100 company like the London Stock Exchange, Relix, Burberry, Sage, all of these are businesses that we anticipate could be much, much bigger businesses, even though they're all still in the FTSE 100, much, much bigger businesses over the next, let's say, half decade. Now, also uh, 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 on this point, uh, I, I, I want to observe as well that of the just about 9% of Finsbury's portfolio that's not invested in FTSE 100 companies or their equivalent. So in other words, the roughly 9% of the portfolio that's invested in mid cap or smaller cap ideas, of that 9%, nearly 7% of that 9% is made up of companies with no debt, and net cash on their balance sheet. In other words, when we take some liquidity risk, look down the market capitalization spectrum for outstanding brands or franchises, nonetheless, we want to make sure that those businesses are exceptionally uh, conservatively financed and sound. Now, the second uh, observation I want to make about the strategic positioning of Finsbury's portfolio is this. The way that I analyze the portfolio structure, the way we think about the portfolio structure, is to split it across four thematic ideas, four industry or thematic buckets. And in order of size, those four buckets are as follows. Finsbury today has 42% of its portfolio by value 
invested in what I, perhaps bullishly, perhaps bullishly, but invested in what I call digital winners. Now, I must admit there is a degree of latitude, perhaps, in the definition of what constitutes a digital winner. So, for instance, I've allowed myself to include within that 42 percent uh, at least one company that some investors might not regard as a digital business at all. And that's Manchester United, of which I'm going to say a little bit more later. It's also true that within that 42 percent, I'm also including the one and a bit percent that we still have invested in Pearson. And for sure, however else you describe Pearson, you certainly wouldn't necessarily describe it as a digital winner, at least not yet. I have to say, we watch the marked upsurge in um, uh, signups to Pearson's virtual schools business in 2020 with some interest. Okay, moving on, the next bucket is 34% of the portfolio is invested in beloved or trusted consumer brands, notably global consumer brands. Then we have 15.5% of the portfolio invested in luxury, premium or aspirational consumer brands. And here I must just note that I've cut myself some slack just to let you know, and I've included within that 15 and a half percent, I've included 2% of our exposure to Diageo, which I've taken out of the 34% in beloved and trusted brands, but I've included 2% of that in premium and luxury because I want to highlight the 20% plus and growing proportion of Diageo's revenues that are in their reserve and premium brands. That is a wonderful collection of premium spirits brands. The growth of those premium brands is going to drive value for Diageo as far ahead as we can, as far ahead as we can see. So those three buckets combined make up 91.5% of Finsbury's portfolio. The remaining roughly 8.5% is invested in stock market proxies, and particularly it's invested in asset management companies with substantive and growing private wealth offerings. And that's largely, wholly, because we believe that the provision of private wealth services, that's, that's a growth, that's a growth business. So just returning to my opening gambit, the reality is that that portfolio shape that I've just outlined to you, that really hasn't changed much during the course of 2020. And frankly, why, why should it? Um, each of those four segments we would submit, each of those four segments are winning industries, winning ideas, and we can't see any reason why they shouldn't continue to be winning ideas. Now, having said that, I do acknowledge, I do acknowledge that over time, I would both expect and hope that the digital winners bucket and the luxury and premium brands bucket will both grow proportionately uh, uh, as part of the uh, as part of the the total. And I would expect both of those two buckets to grow in part because I would expect the capital gains from those segments to lead 
Finsbury's NAV progression, but also, also because when we have the opportunity and when we can do so judiciously, we intend to continue to increase the exposure of the portfolio to both digital winners and luxury, uh, luxury branded companies. And in earnest of that proposal, could I just remind you that, in fact, during the tumult of 2020, um, we've been fortunate enough to uh, still issue new stock for Finsbury and the combination of new capital to deploy and wild, wild uh, stock market has enabled us to initiate two new holdings for the strategy uh, in 2020 to date. First new holding, and this fits the digital winners theme, the first new holding is Experian. Uh, we've built now Experian up to just short of a 2% holding. There's more to do. But absolutely, we see Experian as evidently one of the UK's rare, and it's a shame that it's rare, <laughs> but one of the UK's rare, globally significant, multi billion sterling market cap companies doing something smart with data and digital technology. For Experian to work from here as an investment, and obviously we, we believe it's going to, we need to see more R&D work being done by the company on smart algos, on Ever more refined, uh, ever more refined analytics. The second new holding in 2020, I must say, I regard as us as being very fortunate, very fortunate indeed, to have been given an opportunity earlier this year to initiate a holding in Fever Tree at a very, very depressed share price. Um, and obviously, Fever Tree fits this premium luxury branded theme. And do you know what? For, for me, if I had to pinpoint the trigger, the trigger that convinced me uh, and my colleagues that we needed to have exposure to Fever Tree's wonderful brand within our portfolio, the, the trigger was seeing Diageo marketing materials, Diageo's marketing materials, where the company combines images of Johnny Walker Black Label with Fever, Fever Tree soda water. It was that kind of mutual uh, joint halo effect, if you like, you know, the, the premium spirits brand choosing to enhance its reputation by associating itself with a premium mixer and vice versa that persuaded us that Fever Tree's brand is, well, truly, truly valuable and, well, in our opinion, uh, a long, long way still to go. OK, I, I, I'm going to move on now from the structure of the portfolio. Um, I find, in all candour, I have nothing to say about the macro outlook, um, largely because I haven't the faintest idea, of course. But contrarily, contrarily, I find I have a whole lot to say about the micro outlook, if I can make that contrast. I've got a whole lot of scuttlebutt to share with you. Uh, in other words, I've got a lot of, well, maybe more or less random, but a lot of more or less random facts or observations to make about the companies that we're invested in. And these are all relatively recent facts, uh, facts that 
we think are at least intriguing about the companies we're invested in, and maybe more than that, maybe they're encouraging. So with your patience, I'm gonna share, uh, share some of these facts with you. So I have to say for me, uh, one of the best bits of recent good news, one of the best bits of recent good news was revealed at Relex's, Reed Elsevier's, nine month results, which came out two or three, two or three weeks ago. And with those results, Relex was able to update investors with these facts that submissions to Elsevier's subscription scientific journals, and of course Elsevier is the biggest division within Relex, submissions to Elsevier's subscription journals have accelerated markedly in 2020 and are up 25% on last year. In addition, submissions to Elsevier's open access journals, now that's a smaller part of Elsevier's business, but growing quickly, submissions to Elsevier's open access journals have doubled year on year. Now, I thought that was very good news, and I thought it was very good news for two reasons. First of all, it demonstrates in a digital age, it demonstrates that scientists still believe that getting their work published on Elsevier, in Elsevier's journals, is the best way for their work to get recognition and to be widely read. That's reassuring for that franchise. Second, though, I would say, <laughs> I just found it reassuring, heartening, to see that scientists around the globe are clearly redoubling their efforts to help humanity deal with all that's afflicting us. And of course, we wish the scientists well in their endeavors. Just as a by the by, uh, and I also think that this is illuminating, Relex also pointed out that uh, in the nine month numbers, that driver miles in the United States, driver miles are now back to 90% of their pre-COVID levels. It's showing you something about the resilience of the US economy. It's also very, very important for uh, Relex's most rapidly growing and value creating division, which is its insurance and risk analytics business. Moving on, Sage. Sage hosted a technology seminar uh, right at the end of September a technology seminar for investors and analysts. And one of the statistics that emerged from that seminar is that this year, 25%, a quarter of all VAT invoices, a quarter of all VAT invoices in the UK have been processed on Sage business cloud. We thought that was a pretty impressive statistic and it leads us to wonder whether Sage's transition towards being a fully fledged cloud software service provider, whether Sage's transition is being underestimated by other investors. Last week, last week, Hargreaves Lansdowne suffered an outage on its platform. As I'm sure you know, on the day of the Pfizer vaccine news, volumes 
volumes across the platforms went up tenfold within the space of a couple of hours and Hargreaves platform creaked, the capacity creaked. Um, and listen, I, I understand absolutely you can parse that event from two perspectives. Obviously, it's not good <laughs> when your customers can't transact. On the other hand, to us, it's it's part and parcel of something that we've been watching with this with this company. Think about this. In its financial year to June 2019, in its year to June 2019, Hargreaves received 1.7 million transactions on its platform delivered by a mobile device. Now, in its financial year to June 2020, that 1.7 million transactions by a mobile device had turned into 4.2 million transactions. In other words, an explosive growth of interaction between the platform and its customers via a digital device. That growth is driving overall revenue growth for Hargreaves Lansdowne. It's growing in double digits in 2020. Yeah, and there aren't a lot of there aren't a lot of UK companies growing at double digits uh, this year. Heineken. Heineken's having a tough year. We own Heineken and have done for many years in Finsbury's portfolio. Of course, you know, the bars, particularly in Europe, have shuttered again, sadly, for everybody. Um, and not surprisingly, at Heineken's third quarter results, again, a couple of weeks ago, not surprisingly, the company had to admit that organic volumes of its beverages, organic volumes of its beverages worldwide are down 8%. And actually the fall in operating profits is much worse than an 8% fall because of the operating leverage within Heineken's business. Nonetheless, within that sorry tale, there was a fact that really made us sit up. And that is that the biggest and the most profitable brand that Heineken owns, the biggest and most profitable brand actually grew over the same period year on year. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that that biggest and most pro profitable brand is the eponymous Heineken brand itself and volumes of Heineken the brand were up a percent just one percent uh, from the year before. Nonetheless I have to say we thought that that was a remarkable achievement for the Heineken brand. Um, that growth very much driven by the incredible success of Heineken Zero um, which the company says is the single most successful new product launch in Heineken's history. I have to tell you, it's being drunk by the crate load at train towers. Um, but the, the fact that Heineken, the brand, could grow at all in this recent, uh, this recent period to us is really encouraging. And, you know, no surprise, no surprise that on the Pfizer vaccine news, Heineken's stock price up 20%, you know, <laughs> almost instantaneously. You know, you, you don't want to miss the eventual resumption of compounding growth in this wonderful, this wonderful company. Um, not surprisingly, uh, another business that's having a tough time in 2020 is Manchester United. Uh, Manchester United has just reported a quarterly loss. Now, I know I mentioned earlier that I had perhaps 
uh, controversially uh, chosen to include Manchester United in our digital winners bucket. The reason for that to us evidently, the reason for that is because we absolutely expect the digital platform companies in the world, the digital platform companies in the world to continue bidding up the price and value of broadcast rights for sports. And if that's right, football, global football, will absolutely be the major beneficiary of that continuing inflation and escalation in the value of sports rights. While we're waiting, though, let me just share one statistic that Manchester United shared with investors at its most recent quarterly results, and that was this. Over the last 12 months, hits, digital hits to Manchester United's social media assets, digital hits were 1.1 billion. 1.1 billion individual hits to their site. That's up 24% over the last 12 months. There's absolutely no evidence that the world's fascination with this franchise and other leading sports franchises has waned at all. And in an increasingly digital planet, attention, any attention that can be brought to digital platforms is of increasing value. Now listen, I could go on and on with these sorts of scuttlebutt examples. But I think the, the point is clear. I hope I've made my point clear. It's so crucial not to confuse a short term tactical set of problems that the world is facing at the moment, not to confuse that or let that mask true secular underlying progress from, uh, from companies. OK, I, 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 I'm going to conclude uh, I'm going to conclude this session with I, I, I want to talk about. The distant past uh, and also the I suppose the distant future, at least distant by the standards of the time horizons of most investors, um, I want to talk a bit about Unilever. Uh, and I want to talk about Unilever partly because it's an important holding, but partly also because what I've got to say, I hope gives you some sort of perspective on the way that we think about the we think about the equity investment challenge. So Unilever. Um, Unilever has a listing on the S&P 500. It listed on the S&P as long ago as 1964. Now, between 1964 and 1991, Unilever's share price went up a hundredfold. Yeah? It was a hundred bagger over that 27 year period, not a bad advertisement for a steadily compounding business, admittedly, or maybe even importantly, during a period of strongly rising inflation. Since 1991, Unilever's share price in sterling is up a further 12-fold. Uh, and I'm not including any reinvested dividends at all there. It's up 12 times in terms of its capital value. By contrast, the FT or share index has trebled. Yeah, a 12 bagger compared to a three bagger for Unilever. That's showing you what a winning company can do for you. Over the last five years, Unilever's share price is up about 65%. For the next 
for those of us laboring away in the UK stock market, and of course, that's what Finsbury does. For those of us laboring away in the UK stock market, let me give you the morose reminder that while Unilever has gone up 65% over the last five years, the FT All Share Index is up about one and a half percent. Just miserable stuff. But listen, there's an important reason to explain why Unilever has been such a strong share price over the last five years. And that's this. Unilever's biggest emerging market exposure is India. And Unilever takes its exposure or has its exposure to India via the medium of its near 70% shareholding in Hindustan Lever, which is India's biggest consumer goods business. Now, listen, over the last five years, Hindustan Lever's share price is up 270 percent in sterling terms, up 270 percent. And as a result, Unilever's stake in Hindustan Lever now represents, well, just short of 30 percent of Unilever's market capitalization. We would absolutely expect over the next five, over the next 10 years, Hindustan Lever to become an even bigger proportion of Unilever as the Indian economy gets wealthier. By the way, Hindustan Lever had its quarter three results two or three weeks ago. Do you know what Hindustan Lever's revenue growth was over the last quarter, year on year? Up 16%. Yeah, it's not only technology companies that are growing rapidly around the world in 2020. And I suppose my conclusion on Unilever is why would we think about selling? Why, why would we want to let go of this proven winning company when it's so evidently evident that there's still a lot of value creation to come? Now, Unilever, it's just a part of Finsbury's portfolio. It's an important part, but it's just a part of the portfolio. When I look across the rest of Finsbury's portfolio, there, in our opinion, are a lot of other proven, incredible winning businesses that we own. The London Stock Exchange is up 22 times since it listed. Sage is up 127 times since it listed. Schroeder's is up 14 times since it listed. Diageo is up 15 times since the late 1980s. Heineken is up 21 times since the late 1980s. Listen, it's very traditional. It's very simple, but it can be so powerful. This piece of advice, run your winners. That's what we're doing in 2020. Thanks for listening to me. Now take any questions you may have. Okay, Nick, the first question we have here. Uh, this individual would be very interested to know of any uh, views on LSE share price and where it goes from here. <laughs> so would I. <laughs> um, you know, doubtless in the in the short term, you know, over the next uh, six weeks or whatever, the the LSE share price will be determined by the eventual outcome of the EU's competition authorities' consideration of whether or not this transaction with Refinitiv is, is allowed to go through. Um, and you know what? I, we just don't know. Um, uh, you know, the EU has been 
you know, I'm not being overly pejorative about the EU, but the EU has in the past been unhelpful uh, 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 towards allowing, you know, technology data type businesses to uh, to consolidate and to grow across Europe. And maybe that will be their decision uh, this time. Um, we we will we will see. Um, I, I think, though, in the longer term. Um, we would still see the LSE as being very well positioned, even without Refinitiv. And I, you know, I, I prefer that transaction happen, but even without Refinitiv, the LSE has got some, yeah, important, uh, important uh, strategic opportunities uh, and, and, sorry, I'm rambling here, growth drivers. What I do want to say is that as recently as last year, remember, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange made a, an initial tentative merger proposal to the London Stock Exchange above today's share price. Yeah, uh, And doubtless, if the LSE had been willing to talk to the Hong Kong Exchange, it would have been an even higher share price than today. And although it was right that the LSC didn't engage with Hong Kong, we have no doubt that ultimately the destiny for the LSE is to um, uh, 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 interact more to, for, its, for its services, um, for its liquidity to interact more with China. Um, it already has a, a joint venture arrangement with the Shanghai Exchange. That was the reason not for going with uh, for not going with Hong Kong. Um, strategically, that is the big opportunity, and of course, it's an opportunity that it's very difficult for the U.S. exchanges to pursue because of the geo geopolitical the geopolitical situation. So we'll see, but. Um, yeah, I, I remarked that the LSE had been a, a winning investment. Um, lots of reasons to think that that can continue. Thanks, Nick. Another one here. Um, would you prefer to have greater scope to invest more of the portfolio internationally? And do you find the UK too restrictive for your best ideas? Um, I, I'm just going to I'm just going to say a point blank. No, no to that. Um, I. I, I the, the, the UK, the UK is where my expertise is. Um, the UK, forgetting the last five years, has been a wonderful place for investors. Um, there's a very entrepreneurial, innovative, shareholder-focused uh, society and economy that we have here. Um, I, I've never been short of enough ideas to populate a portfolio. Uh, I have to say, and listen, I know that this is me having been a UK equity investor since the early 1980s, my goodness me, I'm old. I know this is partly me talking out of self-interest, but I, I do really think that there is a tactical opportunity in UK listed companies today, just simply when you compare their valuation and their share price performance with similar companies around the world, it's clear that asset allocators have been placing a discount on a London listing. I might just, because it's, it's, it's quite high in my mind at the moment, um, one of the reasons that we one of the less important reasons, I have to say, but a reason that we initiated in Experian is that we could see the valuation and the share price performance in 2020 of its comparator Equifax in the United States. I, I think it's, it's perfectly easy to argue that Experian is a better business. It's certainly a more diverse business than Equifax. Equifax year to date is up 22%, Experian's up 10%. Uh, to me, I see that difference as predominantly the current 
you know, downer that investors have about the UK. So absolutely for choice at the moment, I'd rather increase our exposure to UK assets because that's where the relative opportunity is. I see. Another question here. How do you decide which overseas stocks make it into Finsbury growth? For example, Remy is in the top 10 holdings within Finsbury, but doesn't appear in the top 10 within your open-ended mandate. If it isn't, it's very close. Um, I, I mean, it's in the open-ended mandate, it's a 4.6, 4.7% holding. I think I, I think it's 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 a, it's closer to five for for Finsbury, but but it's it's the same. It's the same weighting. Um, how do we decide? Um, it's it's looking for ideas that we can't access in the UK, um, but but ideas that are central, for good or for ill, central to where we have the highest confidence in our ability to identify to identify value. So. Um, there is no way to access, well, it's very hard to access premium cognac uh, within the context of the UK stock market. Diageo does have a look through exposure to, to Hennessy, but it's a tiny proportion of, uh, a relatively small proportion of Diageo. We understand how cognac is a beneficiary of wealth creation around the world. I toyed with the idea, I'm rambling slightly, I toyed with the idea of actually including the holding in Remy, not in our luxury segment, but in our digital winners segment. <laughs> that would have been a stretch, but, but listen, the, um, the growth, the, the creation of wealth in the United States, particularly digital wealth, has turbocharged consumption and sales of premium cognac in the United States. That's the reason why Remy's share price has done so well in 2020. Um, and actually, I was just looking at this. Uh, you don't have to be impressed by this. Maybe you just say this is me trying to comfort myself. But actually, over the last five years in sterling, Remy has outperformed NASDAQ. Yeah, it, it's up actually somewhat more than NASDAQ is over the last five years. And I think that's, that's a reassuring demonstration that if you can own the right premium brand, particularly a brand that benefits from wealth creation, then you can, you know, you can participate even in a big tech bull market like NASDAQ. That's it. Another question here. Can you provide an update on the wider Linsel Train team? What investment ideas from the team have you uh, have you most regretted not following thus far? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, you know, our, our team, you know, there are six of us, including Mike and I. Um, James Bullock and Madeline have become essentially fully fledged portfolio managers. Um, I mean, James, that's true of James from a number of years ago, actually, but, but Madeline was appointed joint manager uh, this year of our new uh, North American fund. Um, I, I, actually, I'm not going to say anything more about, about that, but just to demonstrate the progress that Mike and I see is being made by this group of very bright, but also very impressionable young people who we've been <laughs> molding in our uh, in our likeness. Um, you know, it's true to say, I think that all of the recent new additions to Linsel Train portfolios, not just Finsbury, all of them have been significantly influenced, if not driven by our colleagues. Absolutely, the work on Experian uh, was done by Madeline. Uh, the work on Fever Tree was done by Ben. Um, the newest holding in our global fund, Prada, um, which has actually been a fantastic performer, actually, thank goodness. Um, that was driven by the work that Madeline had done on the uh, on the luxury sector. 
Um, so yeah, um, you know, we're, we're the, the the two old men in the team are definitely feeling the the full force and influence of our younger colleagues. Uh, that's great. Thanks, Nick. Just building on that uh, point, what has what has the firm learnt so far from running a dedicated US fund? It, it would be premature to 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 comment in terms of performance. Um, but I mean, it's up. <laughs> That's good. Um, but but what I would say is that um, the preparatory work prior to that fund launch was maybe 18 months of research led by James Bullock, um, obviously with the help of the team, on opportunities in the in the United States stock market, and already that work has informed um, the way we've chosen to allocate capital um, across all of the all of the portfolios. Um, and you know, I, I know in my my earlier remarks, that I, and it was true that the actual reason to buy fever tree was seeing those Diageo, those Diageo marketing materials. But Ben had done a lot of work on monster beverages uh, over the last, again, yeah, 15 months or something, considering whether that might make, make it into the US portfolio. Actually, it, it didn't, but it's, it's, it's on a list of potential investments. But his work on monster beverages business model and well, the incredible success achieved by that brand was an important yeah, introduction for me to think about how you might value, value fever tree and also think about its potential for growth. So yeah, there, there's already been a, a, a valuable, valuable overlap. Thanks, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but, but how much uh, does technical analysis form part of your investment decision-making process? technical analysis um I, i'd say none um except that we we try to be well behaved as investors it, 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 you know so, sometimes it's just the, the little housekeeping things that you do or that you don't do you hope anyway that they make a marginal difference. So, you know, famously, we try and sit on our hands and not trade, not, not follow the, the, the technicals. But when, when we do have capital to, to allocate, we, we, we try and discipline ourselves to do it on a down day for the stock or, or, or a, a, a weak period for, for the market. So. To, to that extent, if that's technical analysis, we, we want to avoid buying into euphoria and we want to try and discipline ourselves to, to buy on down days. And, and again, I, 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 you know, I've been doing this a long time, but I still find that emotionally difficult. I don't, I don't know whether that's true for those of you who are listening, but you know, we've had so many days and so many prolonged periods this year of the UK stock market just being so so moribund and every part of your soul rebels against yeah, taking advantage of that but you think oh i'll just wait i just need a bit of good news um but of course it's right to 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 buy into that sentiment as was reinforced by the that incredible pfizer day you know you just you just miss it you, you simply can't find the time to, as I said, buy the Heineken, which you know is a wonderful business and will prosper for, you know, the next 50 years, uh, you won't find the time to buy that when the news actually turns. So that, that's maybe what I'd say. Thanks. Could you also just revisit the rationale for owning Fever Tree and, uh, and just touch on the possibility of being a takeover target for uh, a large soft drinks company or a distiller? Um, a bit of scuttlebutt um, in the white times today. I, I must admit, I hadn't seen I hadn't seen the announcement, but um, Schweppes have withdrawn their competing premium mixer um, out of the UK market, um, or, or, or 
maybe that's been forced on on Schweppes. Um, the the Tesco and certainly Tesco has refused to to give it shelf space because it's simply just not selling. Um, core Schweppes is still doing okay, but but the premium end of it, Fever Tree, Fever Tree just owns it. Um, no, listen, you, the 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 opportunity for Fever Tree in the United States in particular, Europe also, um, that, 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 that is more than enough to justify the current enterprise value of Fever Tree. Um, what the work that Ben did on monster beverages, the, the work that he did shows that um, a business model like Fever Trees and like Monsters, which doesn't do its own bottling, that is a capital light business model. That just structurally means that the returns on capital are higher to a branded business like Fever Tree in the 21st century than they could ever conceivably have been in the 20th century. And that systematic higher potential return on capital, just as we see around the world with digital virtual companies, just, um, just merits a higher, a higher valuation. Um, I, I don't know about a takeover. I mean, I, 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 I sincerely hope not, I, I really do. Um, but it, it, you know, it is interesting to see Heineken, or, or actually more strictly speaking, the Heineken family taking a stake in Double Dutch, which is um, a, a sort of equivalent to uh, to Fever Tree in the Netherlands. Uh, and I think it, it, you know, as as we all know, mixers have been part of big brewers' business models. Um, I, could see the logic, uh, but I can't really see the logic for a shareholder in a fever tree to surrender their equity in this company at this juncture of the company's potential development at anything else but a really, really crazy price. But, but you know, we'll see. And it, we know you've talked about Bailey Gifford and uh, Warren Buffett, but are, are there any other managers that you that you continue to follow closely? Uh, Sorry, I, I'm not sure I can. I, probably the answer is no. I mean, I, I keep coming back to, I keep coming back to to Peter Lynch. Um, you know that that, and forgive forgive the the sort of tub thumping monologue at the end of those comments um, about share prices that have doubled, trebled, quintupled, gone up tenfold over time. Um, but 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 it is true. Um, that they have, and that's that's very much the the Peter Lynch methodology for earning exceptional returns. Now there are a whole sort of a whole variety of different ways to be successful in this game. I mean, you know, absolutely there are, but but that's the way we've chosen to 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 attempt this for on behalf of shareholders. And I, I find going back to I find going back to Lynch, um, you know, always educational. In terms of portfolio construction, at what point does single stock concentration make you uh, queasy? Um, obviously, it depends on the the, the caliber of the, the franchise. Um, you know, I, I, again, amongst friends and being candid with you, I mean, I've been much more queasy about the, I don't know, 1.4% we've had invested in Pearson over the last couple, much more queasy about that than the 11% we've had in the London Stock Exchange. Um, just because you know, the, the disparity between the, yeah, be, 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 between the growth path for the, the, the two companies, just maybe even the the integrity existential issues for both companies is is so great. Um, practically speaking, um, 
we don't add to any holding once it hits 10 percent um so so that's a self-imposed limit um and also we will actively reduce positions if they get to 12 and a half percent um so 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 there's there's a there's a, a couple of admittedly very broad protocols but no I, I, absolutely where, where we where we have positions pushing towards 10 percent or around 10 percent for me to sleep at night they need to be in businesses of the predictability of a Diageo, a Unilever, a Relex, you know, and that's that's where we are. Okay, great, thank you. Could you also give us some insight into the way you think about environmental and impact uh, questions as they relate to the businesses you currently own? We've got a, um, uh, 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 the head of our um, marketing team, um, our institutional marketing team has been, been with us a couple of years. Um, very bright, very energized, very, very capable lady, Jess Cameron. Um, she's been working with us to um, help formalize the way we discuss and report on our ESG um, activities. Um, and obviously, of course, our, our um, our principles and <laughs> it, it, it it intrigues me I, I know this could sound flippant it could sound complacent and, and there's more to be done there is more to be done but J Jess has said to Michael Linsel and me she said do you know I think that you've been outstanding ESG investors ever since you established Linsel Train back in 2000 um, because everything we do is focused on let's use the word sustainability but also survivability longevity everything we do is based on a confidence let's hope it's not misplaced but a confidence that we can see far enough ahead to be certain that a given company's products or services will remain relevant or trusted or beloved or useful to its customers and absolutely clearly then the, the companies need to ensure that those products meet the well they have to be legal but over and above being legal that they, they have to reflect changing consumer attitudes uh, and changing the societal attitudes so you know an investment in Unilever for instance you, you know we've owned that for a very long time I'm I'm so happy we've owned it for a very long time a reason that we've been long-term investors in Unilever is because if you'll allow me the cliche we have observed the journey that Unilever has been on over the last couple of decades to improve its environmental standards and its governance standards. Um, and I, you know, I think there's a good case to argue that Unilever, which is now the biggest listed company in the UK stock market, um, you know, that that's been a real standard bearer uh, uh, in the world actually for, for these sorts of principles. And we've applauded that and will continue applauding it. Thanks, Nick. Another question here. Change, do the changing habits of the millennial generation pose a, a threat to the future revenue growth of some of the luxury and uh, drinks brands within, within the portfolio? Conceptually, yes. And, you know, of course, we want to, to monitor these and to protect our shareholders if we do see any secular or permanent decline in the relevance or resonance of a of a of a given brand um but but i have to say you know just th this is what the scuttlebutt's for isn't it i mean this is what we're doing we're constantly monitoring for, for signals that something fundamental might have deteriorated for for a franchise um <laughs> you know uh, Shmernoff vodka for Diageo, I mean that 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 probably is 
In fact, that certainly is a brand that lost some resonance, um, some affection. Um, and it's to us, it's hard to see how that can be recaptured given the nature of vodka. Um, difficult to flavor it, it's difficult to, 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 to make it distinctive. But, you know, we, we observe that Diageo has been able to resuscitate um, brands like Crown Royal. Um, it's been able to create new brands like Bullet Bourbon in the United States. It's been able to acquire and grow tequila brands, uh, Don Julio and Casamigos, that are absolutely what... Um, what the millennial generation are, are, are drinking. So, yeah, you know, we, we want to make sure that the companies, the companies can respond. Interesting, you know, we've got this this holding in in Mondelez, um, Oreos, mm, obviously Cadbury, and you know, we watch it, want to watch that very closely. Um, but you know, really interesting to see that. In 2020, um, the, those brands are growing more quickly than ever worldwide, and indeed taking share. Um, so, no evidence there of the millennial generation losing its sweet tooth. Good. Uh, are there any companies you currently believe are, are, are cheap or particularly interesting? And what does the Linsell Train UK subs bench look like? <laughs> I, that you know the, the the a lot of what we own, particularly the the sterling denominated companies, look look ridiculous to me. I mean, uh, you know, another bit of scuttlebutt. I mean, you you, you know, you've seen Alex Chesterton um, create apparently yet another digital winner in the UK. Love Film first, then Zoopla, now Kazoo. Um, Kazoo's recent last round of funding, Kazoo purportedly valued at £2 billion with the possibility of a listing at some point. Um, our investment in Daily Mail and General Trust, they own 20% of Kazoo. Um, it's a £400 million theoretical stake they own uh, in Kazoo, having made half a billion pounds out of their investment with Chesterton in Zoopla, um, you know, if that's anything like right, then the current market capitalization of Daily Mail and General Trust is just ridiculously too low. Um, I mentioned that we'd, um, we'd relatively recently last year initiated a holding in Prada for, um, for our global fund. Um, Prada's done well this year. Um, share prices up, I think, about 15% so far in 2020. Um, I look at our investment in Burberry, uh, in Finsbury, in our UK funds. I look at Burberry down 25% year to date. That's a big disparity for two businesses, Prada and Burberry. Okay, neither of them are perfect, but yeah, they both have really significant um, heritage and you know, huge opportunity in Asia with, with, with China. And I, I just think that's value being left on the table in the, in, in the UK. So I don't know, I'm not gonna talk about things on the reserve bench. We just bought a couple of them already this year, but um, you know, more than happy, more than happy to add to existing UK holdings. Um, and if I might be, yeah, cliched enough to, to, to say, uh, you know, I've been buying more stock in Finsbury for myself this year uh, with an increasing cadence uh, because, yeah, the opportunity seems very, very material. How portfolio companies use the pandemic to strengthen their market positions in a way that you would, would have liked to see? Can you cite some examples? Yes, I can. Um, you know, when we, we spoke to every portfolio company, you won't be surprised to hear, we spoke to every portfolio company in March and April 
and we had two questions. Um, the first was, are you going to go bust? Um, and we, none of them have. <laughs> um, and we knew that they weren't, but but you know you still want that reassurance that that a business is robust enough to to deal with something um, as disruptive as as this. But the second question was, how are you going to take advantage from of your relatively strong balance sheet or your relatively predictable cash flows? And I think that is, um, you know that that is a characteristic of the businesses that we invest in. How are you going to take advantage of that to come out of the crisis as a stronger business? And yeah, the 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 the, the companies have got um, you know across the portfolio have got some some um, you know some obvious obvious answers to that. Um, you know, I think that a statistic that I didn't mention, which I think is important to note is that going back to that dull steady but rather wonderful plodder Unilever um, one of the standout features to us about Unilever's third quarter results um, again when was that a month or so ago one of the standout features was the 76% growth 76% growth year on year in Unilever's e-commerce revenues. And that now means that e-commerce represents around 10% of Unilever's overall business uh, and higher than that in its biggest market, which is the United States. Now, that's not saying that Unilever's becoming a digital company or an internet company. It's not saying that at all, but it is saying here his here is the way that a company with beloved or trusted brands can take advantage of a shift or a fundamental change in distribution channels, can take advantage of that to keep its brands relevant. Um, we're going to see results tomorrow from Sage. Um, I'm a little bit hopeful. We'll see. Don't do anything before tomorrow. Let's wait and see. But um, very impressed by the way that Sage has offered all sorts of um, functionality to its hard pressed small company clients in the UK for free um, so far in 2020. I think that's been a, a very smart thing to do um, for the uh, integrity existence of its customer base, but also acting as a way to show what additional functionality services that Sage is now in a position to offer its very substantive customer base. And yeah, I do, I do wonder, as I said, I, I don't know for sure, but I do wonder whether Sage may be able to demonstrate a pickup in its, um, in its growth rate there, which, well, would be very encouraging. Thanks, Nick. Could you just provide some comment on uh, the UK private client wealth management landscape and your and your views on its future potential growth? Um, well, you know, from one from one perspective, you know, we we can see um, big investment banks, integrated banks, uh, private equity. We we can see these institutions allocating more and more capital to to private wealth um, and to us that's that's rational um, because the returns from a successful private wealth business are both higher and more predictable than institutional um, institutional type assets and Evidently, as well, there's there's a tremendous, um, maybe necessary, or at least uh, so far it's been necessary, fragmented market in in private wealth. Uh, I think that the the proposition that we hear from ex existing market players, but also from players who are trying to get into the market, is they think that there's a big opportunity to apply technology to the provision of private wealth services 
to apply technology in a way that significantly enhances the customer experience. I'm not necessarily talking about investment performance, but just overall making the experience superior for customers. And yet at the same time, the greater use of technology could significantly reduce the cost of delivering those services. And, you know, that's if also if you put the cherry on top of the cake, if you believe that wealth is going to continue to be created, that economies will grow, that more and more individuals will need this service, then you've got the combination for winning investments. You know, the, these have already been winning investments over the last couple of decades. Um, a 40 or I, they can go on and be even bigger winners, we would hope. I'm conscious of the, the time here, so let's just squeeze this one in. Uh, what is your thinking behind your your or three of your smallest holdings, Celtic, Fullers and Youngs? Well, they are they are scrappy holdings in unique, irreplaceable assets that if we have the opportunity, we would like to see as 1% holdings or I guess we would like to see disappear from the portfolio ultimately um, for a variety of reasons we've not had the opportunity or the incentive to 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 take them to one percent holdings of late to be absolutely candid with you going back to the this this issue about the uk stock market um the, 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 value, the value that's available in FTSE 100 companies just seems so great that, I mean, I, I'm not saying other people wouldn't do this, but what, why bother messing around in, in smaller cap stuff? Um, you know, there's a big, big real opportunity in big, liquid, globally significant companies. Thanks, Nick. Final question. Uh, how does the team guard against confirmation bias, and when do you decide not to run your winners? You know, there's the the, 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 the no no approach to the investment challenge um, is perfect. Everything has a flaw, um, um, and uh, you know we'd be the first to acknowledge that a, a flaw or an issue with the way that we attempt to do it is that we can hold on for things for, for too long. Um, but to us, that's better than chopping and changing and trying to trade in and out. I mean, I'm not saying there are, you know, there are other people who do that brilliantly. We, we know that we can't. Um, that which allows us to own the London Stock Exchange while it goes from four pounds to 80 pounds, that's great, but it's exactly, it's exactly what keeps us in Pearson from eight pounds down to six pounds 30 today over the last 12 years or something that's horrible it's just part and parcel of a given investment approach and in the end we've just got to hope <laughs> that we have more in the lses or we own more of those sorts of secular growth businesses than 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 errors um the 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 common denominator when we have thrown in the towel the common denominator has been concerns about balance sheets um, when we're not only being asked to be patient maybe even more patient than we'd ever thought but when you're being asked to be patient and take the risk of a, a deteriorating balance sheet that's that's too much and that that's when that's when we do exit